once you get a molecule that can self-replicate, that means the conditions for natural selection are satisfied. The origin of DNA is a little more mysterious. And the general sentiment, again, and it's sentiment, not, not strong evidence in the scientific community, is DNA emerged as a kind of safe repository from sort of the cauldron of engaging in chemical, chemical reactions. So the DNA was a sort of a storage or archival form of the genetic information that originally sta started out in RNA. And in fact, um, one of the questions that my own freshman students at college ask me all the time is, why couldn't a cell make do with just one kind of nucleic acid? In other words, why doesn't a cell have everything in DNA or everything in RNA? And I think the answer to that, basically, is that RNA is now used as sort of a cheap, disposable copy that can be made from the archival copy, DNA in the eukaryotic cell nucleus, which stays out of the fray, um, and the RNA goes out into the cytoplasm and actually does sort of the business of expressing the genetic information. So uh, that's a long way of saying we don't know for sure, but those are some of the thoughts of people who work on the problem. Okay, in the blue shirt, that'd be you. Obviously, the evidence shows speciation over time, and, uh, and then, like the evidence um, that you've shown about mouse traps is that uh, elimination of features doesn't eliminate pr uh, the usefulness of the components. Right. Um, but such as in uh, apes to humans, how does uh, environmental stimuli, uh, how can that be shown to increase the genetic information held in humans, not held in apes, which is, I think I heard about 300 million new DNA uh, codons. Well, well the, the, the first thing to appreciate is that we humans as a species did not evolve from apes. Um, we didn't evolve from gorillas or chimpanzees or any species alive today. Rather, we and the great apes share a common ancestor in the past. So often people say, well, I didn't evolve from any monkey. Well, no one ever said you did. What evolution says is that we and monkeys, and for that matter, all organisms, share a common ancestor if you go far enough back. Now, there is, um, uh, now that we have the chimpanzee genome and we can analyze it, you say there's a certain amount of genetic information we have that's not in the others. Well, it's not that we have more genetic information. We have about the same in terms of numbers of DNA bases compared to the other great apes. But our information is different. And one of the things that investigators have focused on in the last year since we've had the chimpanzee genome to compare with ours, and there'll be more focus in the next couple of years when we will get both the gorilla and the orangutan sequence. People are working very hard at these right now is we've been able to pinpoint, pinpoint the spots in our own DNA which have been subject to really, really strong natural selection. And one of the interesting things about this, and this is all very preliminary stuff because the work is just starting to get published, is a lot of these areas of intense natural selection in our DNA concern the development of the nervous system. Now that's really exciting, the brain among other things. It's really exciting because the most striking thing about our own evolution is that one of our organs increased in size by a factor of three in a space of just about three million years compared to the other primates. And for some of you in the audience with, with purient minds, no, it's not the organ you're thinking of. It's the brain that increased by a factor of three. Um, how natural selection... I should have, I should have been aware of, of, of what I'm dealing with in the audience here. Um, the, the interesting thing um, uh, is it's been very difficult to understand how natural selection could have favored what is by all accounts an explosive increase in the size of the central nervous system in the brain. We now are beginning to understand the individual genes that were subject to natural selection that control the development of the nervous system. And I'm pretty confident that within a few years of comparative genetics, we will understand the forces of natural selection that drove that increase, and I think more importantly, for the study of our own biology, the genes that actually control our own mental development. So I don't have an answer for you, but I think the answer is forthcoming very shortly. Good question. Okay, right in the corner. The what human genome mentioned? is getting really close to being done, and some people have been talking about something called the GOG gene or something like that. Yeah. Do you believe in that at all, and do you think it's possible that that could actually exist? Well, the, uh, if, if, for the strict use of words, I'd say belief plays no role in science. I don't believe in evolution. I don't believe in the Krebs cycle. I don't believe in the eukaryotic cell. I accept those things as the best scientific explanation on the basis of evidence. Belief is for things like theology or baseball or football. You might believe in the Redskins, um, but, uh, um, the, well, I believe in the Red Sox and see how it turned out this year. Um, but... The, the, the notion of the God gene has been popularized by a number of writers in neuropsychology. And what they've argued 
is that natural selection on our species has given us an innate capacity in our brains to accept religious explanations for things. Uh, the great Harvard biologist E.O. Wilson argued this almost 30 years ago in his book On Human Nature. And, and Ed Wilson argued that natural selection produced this sort of theological capacity which gives us an ability to unite, to join with fellow human beings around myth, ritual, and religious explanations for things. And the reason that prevailed is because those organisms that were able to do that were better at raising food, hunting down animals, making war, and raising children, all of which are important civilized traits in one sense or another. Therefore, that's why we have the capacity to believe in religion. Steven Pinker, uh, a, a very popular writer on evolutionary psychology, has argued that our brain has a God module, and the God module predisposes us to find religious explanations for things satisfying. Therefore, religion is nothing more than an artifact of this gene or this module in our brain. Now, um, uh, uh, Steve Pinker is someone whom I've talked with about this, and other people have talked, uh, uh, I've talked with other people about it as well. I think that explanation is generally correct. And I say that even though I consider myself a religious person. So how could you do that? Showing that natural selection produced part of our mental capacity, I think, is no different from showing that natural selection produced the rest of our bodies. And if you believe in a creator, if you believe in a supreme being who used natural processes to bring the physical part of our species into existence, why wouldn't that creator have used the same natural processes to bring the mental part of our being into existence, namely the God module? And if I had to answer Steve Pinker, who says, can you go to church on Sunday because you've got the God module and it's taken you over, I'd say, Steve, natural selection, if it produced our ability to form religion, you know what else natural selection also produced? It produced our ability to do science. And it produced our ability to like and accept rational scientific explanations for things. I wouldn't disqualify science by saying that the brain of someone has a science module, and that's why scientific explanations seem sound and reasonable. And I certainly don't think you can disqualify religion by saying natural selection produced a God module that predisposes you to find religious explanations satisfying. But that's a very good question, and you certainly get a trial of bite for that. Okay. Right there, yeah. What is your view on panspermia or exogenesis? Um, panspermia is the notion that life on Earth didn't originate on Earth, but came here from some other place. I find this to be an intriguing notion. Um, I would argue, and I think most biologists would say, that the capacity for life is built into matter. In other words, the very laws of physical physics and chemistry give what we call inanimate matter, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, the capacity to become alive when arranged in a certain way. It, I would be astonished, given the vastness of the universe and the constancy of the laws of physics and chemistry, if this little planet zipping around a medium-sized star in a nondescript galaxy was the only place in the universe where that had ever happened. So I'd be very much surprised if life is only confined to this one planet. Um, do I think life might have come to this planet from somewhere else? It's possible. Meteorites fall into Earth all the time that have organic compounds on them, complex chemicals. Now, how did they originate? We think they originated by the same natural processes that primitive organic chemicals originated on this planet. So that means elsewhere, even in our own solar system, the building blocks of life might be in the process of assembly. I don't think, however, saying that life on Earth arose by panspermia solves the scientific problem of how did the life originate. It would just put it on another planet. One way or another, ultimately, a great scientific challenge is going to be to figure out where life came from. Panspermia doesn't get us any close to that, but I think it's an attractive idea given the vastness of the universe and the capacity of matter for life. Uh, right up front. That'd be you. Do you think there will continue to be breakthroughs in evolution in the future? It's a good question. Will there be breakthroughs in the evolution in the future? There are breakthroughs in evolution literally every time I open a scientific journal. I see one or another of them. There was a paper about three weeks ago that was published in one of the world's leading journals talking about speciation mechanisms, the genetic mechanisms that take a single species and divide it into two and prevent the newly separated uh, species from interbreeding with each other. That's really the first step to forming two species. And what these studies...